Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this lecture I will continue the proof of complete reducibility for finite dimensional representations of SL2C. So, we uh, actually stopped with some calculation in the last class. So, I will continue that calculation uh, now and then I will complete the proof. Okay. So, we define uh, this customer element of SL2C uh, which is actually defined for any representation of SL2C. So, let us recall what it is. So, you take V to be finite dimensional representation of SL2C say phi is that given map from SL2C to this GL of V. Okay. So, then the Casimir element which is element of endomorphism of V given by C equal to phi x phi y plus phi y phi x plus phi of h square by 2. Okay. So, we claim that this is indeed commutes with the action of uh, uh, GL action of SL2 of C. Okay. So, as before uh, we, we just ignore this phi and then do the calculation. So, that will be easier for us. So, we just write C as x y plus y x plus h square by 2. Now, using this relation bracket x y is nothing but uh, h. So, that means x y minus y x is h. We can rewrite this C as h plus h square by 2 plus 2 y x. Okay. So, if you are not comfortable with this you can put phi everywhere not a problem, but anyway this is what happening in endomorphism of v. So, now uh, what is our claim? So, we claim that c phi x is 0 similarly c phi y 0 and c phi of h is 0. As I said in the last class c phi x 0 and uh, c phi y 0 will imply c phi of h is 0 because phi of h is nothing but bracket phi x phi y. So, I will only verify this uh, then uh, other thing you can verify similarly. So, now let us compute what is this uh, c phi x. Okay. So, as I said before we can just ignore phi and then we can just compute uh, c x not a problem. So, this is just exactly equal to h x plus h square x plus 2 y x x. Okay. But look at h square x. So, this is actually given by just you take h h x plus h x h. Okay. If you just work it out you can see that h into h x minus x h. So, that will be the first term plus h, h x minus x h times h that will be the second term. So, if you add up you get h square x. So, then minus h x h plus h x h minus x h square. So, that is going to give you h square x minus x h square. So, now using this uh, you can actually rewrite the identity again let us let us look at what is this second term means the bracket y x x is nothing but y x square minus x into y x. But if you closely pay attention so this is exactly equal to y x minus x y times x. Okay. But bracket x y is nothing but h. So, this implies bracket y x will be minus h. Okay. You can replace here by minus h. So, this is bracket y x x. So, this is minus h x. So, if you put together in the original equation you get c x equal to. So, this h x. So, this is h x minus x y and then you get uh, this h h x and so on. Okay, maybe let us not rewrite let us keep it as it is. So, this is going to be 
bracket hx, bracket hx is going to be 2 x and then 1 by 2 bracket s square x which is just uh, this 1 by 2 h bracket hx which is 2 x plus the bracket hx which is 2 x again h. Then minus you have twice hx. Okay. So, now you just cancel everything and then see what you get. You get 2 x this 2 gets cancelled. So, you get h x minus h y minus 2 h x. Okay. So, but this is uh, if you rewrite here you can see that Two x, so this is uh, going to be giving you one h x. Sorry, this is plus from here. So you write h x minus sorry plus twice x h. Okay, so that will be minus two h x. So then you get exactly 4 x minus 4 x. So, that is 0. Okay. Again we are repeatedly using h x is equal to 2 x and then x h is minus 2 x. Okay. So, similarly one can prove that c phi y is 0 and that would imply c phi h is 0. Okay, so, that means this C commutes with uh, action of G, this action of SL to C. So, now uh, as we observed before, if you assume complete reducibility, uh, then this action of H on this entire uh, finite dimensional representation with should be diagonalizable. Okay. But that is actually uh, indeed very difficult uh, thing to prove at this stage. Uh, but we will construct a subspace on which this h will act. Uh, on that space, it will be easier to uh, prove that h is diagnosable. Okay, then we will use that information to prove this uh, complete disability. But before that, uh, let us do one small exercise, so which is actually very very important at this point. So, if you have two operators acting on a vector space, let us say V is a vector space, again finite dimensional vector space over C if you want. Okay. So, if you have two operators on this V acting on V, let us call it E and H. So, these are all two operators acting on this V such that the bracket of E H. Okay. So, that is given by some scalar times e. So, where we assume that this scalar is not 0. So, if this happens, so then we can actually prove that this e must be nilpotent. Okay. So, this is very interesting exercise uh, that uh, uh, one can do. Okay. Maybe I will outline the proof, uh, you can also think about uh, various proofs of this fact. Okay. The very first deduction that one can does because C is non-zero, you can uh, scale H and then assume that uh, this C is 1. Okay. So, that is the first deduction. So, step 1 replace H by 1 by C H. So, then the equation reads as follows. So, E H will become equal to just E. Okay. So, now if you look at this pan of this E H, okay. so this is inside endomorphism of E or I am looking it as subalgebra. Okay. So, I want to look at inside G L of E. Okay. So, then it is clear that this, this thing is actually a two dimensional non abelian Lie algebra.
okay so in particularly it is solvable so g is solvable okay because if you take the bracket between e h you get e so if you take bracket between h h and e that those things will be zero so it is obviously defining two dimensional non abelian lie algebra and now we can use least theorem because g is solvable so there will be a so you look at the action of g on capital v so there will be a basis for capital v with respect to that basis this e and h both will be upper triangular so now look at e e is actually commutator of two operators so that means e will be inside the derived algebra of g so in particularly with respect to the same basis this e will be actually strictly upper triangular so that proves you have a basis of v with respect to that basis this e is actually strictly upper triangular so that means e must be nilpotent so this is one proof that one can use representation theory and then prove it but i will also encourage you to actually find some other proof for example like uh, once you write uh, e h equal to once you write e h equal to e then it is not hard to see what will be e square h so from our earlier formula e square h is nothing but e times e h plus e h times e so now use this uh, 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 use this uh, formula bracket e h is e then we get e times e, e square plus again e square so that will give you 2 e square so basically e h is e and 2 e square is just uh, again bracket of e square h so what this implies this implies trace of e is zero and as well as trace of e square is zero so now if you have an operator acting on a vector space v over complex numbers okay so this is again exercise if t is an operator from v to v v is finite dimensional vector space over c suppose trace of t power k is 0 for all k okay so one can assume to be k varying from 0 to uh, sorry not 0 so k is varying from 1 to dimension of v but anyway if it is true for all n so this implies that t is nilpotent okay this is also one characterization of t being nilpotent because if t is nilpotent then any power of t will be nilpotent and for any nilpotent operator you know the trace must be zero so this is one characterization of nilpotent now what this computation says uh, trace of e is zero trace of e square is also zero similarly it is not hard to see that if you take e cube and then compute h the bracket of that then it will be uh, again e e square h plus e square h e so then that will give you that uh, this is uh, e cube by 2 sorry 2 e cube plus so e square h is 2 e square so this is 2 e cube plus 2 e cube so you get 4 e cube for this you can simply see that e into e square h minus h e square plus e square h minus h e square into e you get e cube h so this e h e square oh then okay maybe i need on to so here uh, yeah so what we are getting so this is e cube h minus e h e square plus e square h e and then minus h e cube we are getting okay maybe i need to again add and subtract uh, some more terms okay uh, 
but but you can actually again prove that it will be a some multiple of multiple of e cube okay maybe i will leave it to you to check uh, so let us see so what we need to add and subtract so you can actually see that you need only to understand what is happening with this e h okay you can take e h e outside so then you can see that uh, so this is you are going to get e so this e cube h and minus h e cube will give you this bracket e cube h okay yeah but uh, yeah if what will what will happen if you replace this so let's let's do this computation here okay so so this is i'm trying to compute what is happening here okay <clears throat> so you are getting u cube h and then minus e so you can actually replace e square h minus the bracket h e square okay and then plus again e cube h can replace bracket h e okay so this is the term that you get so you can see that uh, this and this will get cancelled so you get e cube h my uh, plus e times h e square so h e square is minus 2 e square so minus 2 e square and then this term will be minus e square so again h e h e will be minus e so you get e cube h is equal to sorry minus twice e cube minus e cube okay so this is what you are getting here so this is going to be equal to 4 e cube so in particularly you can see that e cube h is nothing but some multiple of e cube okay so whatever it is so this way what i'm tr trying to say so if you compute any e power k h you can see that there will be a non zero scalar here and then e power k will be there okay so this is something you can easily verify that would imply that trace of e power k is zero for all k okay so that will imply that e is nil potent so this is one way to verify by doing explicit computations okay so here i have used uh, solvable lie algebra representation theory to prove that e is nil potent so we can also use invariance lemma again to come to prove the same thing okay so why the invariance lemma because if you take this span e inside this g where the span of h and e okay so this is going to be ideal so this is going to be ideal inside g so in particularly uh you know that if you take any eigen space of this e so that should be invariant under both h and e so but e is nothing but bracket h e okay so that says that the trace of this e on that eigen space must be zero but on the other hand what will be the trace of e on the eigen space so that will be just trace of e restricted to v lambda will be just lambda times dimension of e 
So, that that should be 0 because E is nothing but the bracket of H E. So, that makes lambda to be 0, but lambda is any eigenvalue of E. So, now we proved that it is should be 0. So, that proves that E must be nilpotent. Okay. So, there are many ways to prove the same fact, but what this fact immediately implies you. So, you recall what is happening in SL 2 C. So, you write h x equal to 2 x. Okay. Similarly, h y is also equal to minus 2 y. So, this is exactly of this form. Na? So, you go back to your uh, original exercise. So, you have this h e is nothing but some e c times e. So, then you are claiming that E must be nilpotent. So, that is what happening inside SL2 also. So, if SL2 acts on some finite dimensional space V, so if SL2 acts on some V where V is finite dimensional vector space. So, then using this formula you can immediately conclude that both x and y are nilpotent on capital V acts nilpotently okay, on capital V. So, that is immediate. So, now let us use that and then uh, conclude our uh, result. Okay. So, we are going to make another important uh, statement. So, like I said we have some information about x and y. So, this is nothing to do with uh, SL2 representation 3. Uh, basically, this h x being 2 x implies that x should be nilpotent and similarly for y you have nilpotent. So, now if you start with uh, finite dimensional representation of SL2. So, as we predicted the element h should act semi simply on this v, but that is hard to prove as I said. So, what we do we restrict this action of h to the what is called the kernel x. So, this is going to be map from kernel x to kernel x and we can claim that this is indeed nilpotent sorry is diagnosable. So, first of all why this defines a map, okay, let us see that. So, what is the de definition of kernel x? The kernel x is those vector in V such that x kills that V. Okay. So, now you take some V in this and then apply H and then we want to claim that H V is also in kernel x. So, compute what is happening to x H V. So, x H V is nothing but H x V minus h x v okay, because I have used it in reverse way, but x v is 0 already. Then what is h x? h x is 2 x that is also acting on v. So, that is also 0. So, that implies h v is again inside the kernel x. So, this implies when you restrict h to kernel x. So, this maps kernel x to kernel x. So, it makes sense that uh, whether this map is diagonalizable or not. So, that is again simple computation I will leave it to you to check. So, first there are two identities. Okay. The identity 1 says if you apply x y power k v. So, that will be equal to y power k x v plus k times y power k minus 1 times h minus k plus 1. So, this is true for all k greater than or equal to 0 and v in capital V and this is true for all v in v. Okay. It is not only restricted to some kernel x or anything. So, this identity is true for any vector v in v. So, we are thinking this x and y they are all elements of endomorphism of v. So, we are repeatedly applying that x and y. Okay. So, this is true. So, now this is just a induction I will leave it to you to check. So, now what is the second identity says? So, if you restrict to kernel x then we have this following important identity. 
So, we can see that if you take x power k y power k v okay, for v in kernel x then what happens? So, this is going to be equal to some k factorial times h into h minus 1 times etcetera h minus k plus 1 v and this is true for all k k return equal to 1. So, this is always true for only elements in kernel x. Now, we claim that this identity 2 immediately implies h must be diagonalizable on this kernel x. Why? What do you do? You take y. So, this y acts nilpotently on this capital V. So, that means y power n for some large n. So, that is 0 for all v in v. Okay. In particularly this y power n v will be 0 for all v in kernel x also. Okay. So, then if you take this and then substitute back here for that capital N, you can see that x power n, y power n, v. So, that should be 0, but on the other hand you get n factorial times h into h minus 1 etcetera h minus n plus 1 v. Okay. So, that proves that h into h minus 1 etcetera h minus n plus 1 this is identically 0 on kernel x. So, that means the minimal polynomial of h restricted to kernel x so that is going to divide this polynomial, but this polynomial has all the roots distinct okay, because what are all the roots? Roots are 0, 1 etcetera n minus 1 these are all the roots. Okay. So, the roots of uh, this polynomial this, so that implies that the minimal polynomial of h restricted to kernel x okay this polynomial may be polynomial in t that is going to divide this t into t minus 1 etc t minus n plus 1 so that implies that so the roots of this minimal polynomial are all distinct roots of this minimal polynomial are all distinct And that implies that this h restricted to kernel x must be semi simple or diagonalizable. Okay. So, this proves that uh, this uh, h restricted to kernel x must be diagonalizable. In particularly, we can get a eigen basis, okay, so that completely diagonalizes uh, uh, this h. Okay. So, now if we go back to the representation capital V, so this is a finite dimensional representation of SL2C. So, then as we seen before, if we take this Casimir element, so this Casimir element is actually commutes with the action of, uh, commutes with the action of uh, this SL2C. In particularly, I can break v into direct sum of this v theta where theta is coming from c. So, this is this primary decomposition. With respect to theta okay sorry with respect to c. So, then we saw that each, so this v theta what is the definition of this? This is the kernel of c minus some identity power uh, n. Okay. Let me call it uh, yeah, n. So, we know that uh, sorry theta, this is going to be again SL2 sub module. So, if you are interested in proving uh, complete reducibility for finite dimensional representation of SL to C, so it is clear that we can assume uh, this V equal to some generalized eigenspace of this C. Okay. So, what is the meaning of that? So, the, here is the important property of this generalized eigenspace. Uh, this Cosmere element C, it has only theta as eigenvalue on this V theta. Okay. 
So, there is no other Eigen value. So, we can assume that without loss of generality that theta is the only Eigen value of C on this capital V okay, by looking at the primary decomposition. So, now in this case if we decompose V into direct sum of irreducible representation then we are done. So, for that what we do we first understand some of the things. Okay. So, we can actually collect all possible uh, sub representations of this uh, capital V. If you take non-zero sub representation which has smallest dimension then it is easy to see that that uh, sub representation must be irreducible because it cannot contain anything uh, proper inside because this is the that is the smallest representation. So, in particularly given any finite dimensional representation we can always have irreducible sub representation. Okay. So, if you take for example, V of m to be one particular uh, finite dimensional irreducible sub representation of this capital V, uh, then what will happen? So, then we can calculate how this C acts on this V m. Since this is actually SL2 sub representation, so C will map V of m to V of m. Okay, because C is nothing but what x y plus y h plus h square by 2. Each, each element in this uh, expression will map V of m to V of m. So, C will map, uh, but C has Eigen value only theta, but C also commutes with the SL2 action. So, by uh, Schur's lemma C must be some scalar times identity on V of m. We also computed what is that scalar. So, we know that C restricted to V of m is nothing but m square by 2 plus m times this identity on this V of m. Okay. But uh, theta must be only Eigen value. So, in particularly this forces that theta must be equal to m square by 2 plus m. Okay. In case there is another irreducible representation sitting inside this V. Then again from this earlier argument we see that C restricted to V n should map V n to V n and not only that C restricted to V n should look like again some scalar times identity. That scalar is given by n square by 2 plus n times identity. So, that forces that again theta must be equal to this n square by 2 plus n. So, if this m let us say we have fixed, if this is another one then what it says this forces that this m square by 2 plus m must be equal to n square by 2 plus n. But this is actually a quadratic polynomial having two non-negative roots. So, then it must be those two roots must be same. So, that is easy to see. So, that proves if I take any other irreducible copy of irreducible sub representation of this capital V that must be copy of V of m. There is nothing else that can sit inside capital V. So, what is the observation that we made? So, the observation that we made. So, first of all there is a, so what is the assumption that we actually made? So, if C has only one Eigen value in capital V. Okay. So, then any irreducible sub representation V m of capital V should satisfy m square by 2 plus m equal to theta. Okay. So, that means this implies all irreducible sub representations of capital V or the copies of V m. Okay. So, this is a very very important observation. So, now look at the action of H on the kernel x to kernel x. 
So, we know that this is uh, diagonalizable. So, that is we already proved. Since this is diagonalizable, I can actually fix a eigenbasis. So, fix a eigenbasis v1 etcetera v r of this kernel x. So, that means what x v i kills and this h v i acts as some scalar okay call it mu i v i. But the thing is so then this v i becomes maximal vector okay. So, because h x is killing and h is acting as scalar. So, this naturally becomes maximal vector, but if we have a maximal vector we just uh, if you go back to our uh, irreducible representation argument. So, we will be able to generate sub representation generated by v i. So, that you can prove this is span of v i y v i and so on some y power n i v i. So, in particularly this sub representation will become irreducible. So, this becomes irreducible representation and this will become isomorphic to naturally v of n i. Okay. So, that forces this mu i is equal to n i. Okay. So, we have uh, these uh, sub representations generated by v i and then we know that that uh, uh, whatever highest weight or the maximal Eigen value that will be n i. So, now what we are going to do we are going to take this v of j to be that copy of v of n i. So, what is that copy you take to be span c just v j y v j and so on y power n j v j. So, this is going to be isomorphic to v of n j. Okay. So, all these are irreducible sub representations of capital V. So, now what is the climb natural climb is V will be isomorphic to or equal to summation V j j range from 0 j, j range from 1 to r. Okay. So, that is the idea. So, basically what we are doing, so we are looking at the kernel x. So, this kernel x is spanned by v 1 etcetera v r okay. and these things we are choosing it to be Eigen vectors for h. So, this will corresponds to n 1, this will corresponds to n r as h Eigen values. So, then we just generate copies of SL2 representation from this because these are all maximal vectors. So, you take V1 and then apply YV1 etcetera Y power N1 V1 and then take YV2 etcetera Y power N2 V2 and so on then YVR etcetera Y power NRVR. So, each one will you give you one copy of SL2 sorry one copy of irreducible representation. Now, from your earlier argument what you are actually getting. So, if you take uh, this C has only one Eigen value inside capital V then any irreducible represent sub represent must be isomorphic to V of m where this m satisfy this m square by 2 plus m equal to theta. So, that means all irreducible representation are copies of V of m. So, if you put together then you can see that this n 1 must be equal to n 2 etcetera must be equal to n r. Okay. So, basically you are getting only the same copies. So, you have v 1 etcetera v r and then y v 1 y power this m v 1 etcetera y v r etcetera y power m v r. So, this is going to be your copies of v m inside your v theta. If you add them together you can get it for any finite dimensional uh, representation. So, let us see why this is true. So, that is what we are claiming. So, first thing to note uh, this actually exhaust entire thing. So, suppose summation v j, j range from 1 to r. If this is a proper subspace 
then what will happen? If this is a proper subspace then we can actually consider this uh, uh, sub module okay this is going to be a sub representation okay then this is going to be your uh, factor module okay. So, this is a factor module and this is going to be non-zero module. So, this is non-zero module finite dimensional. So, it must contain some irreducible finite dimensional representation sub representation. So, let us say V dash this is sitting inside V modulo summation V of j j range from 1 to r. So, this is finite dimensional irreducible sub representation of this V modulo summation V j. Okay. Now, you know that how this capital V dash should look like. Okay. So, this V dash definitely generated by some maximal vector call that maximal vector V bar. So, V bar inside V dash. So, this is maximal vector. So, x V bar is 0 and h V bar is given by some p times V bar where p is coming from some z plus. Okay. So, now go back to this Casimir element. So, this is a element that is actually maps V to V. Since this summation V j that is also sub module. So, it maps summation V j to again V j summation Vj. So, in particularly the C bar induces a map from V modulo summation Vj to V modulo summation Vj. Okay. So, now the C bar actually maps this uh, uh, factor module to factor module since C actually commits with SL2 action. So, C bar also commits with SL2 action and since uh, V uh, this factor module is a quotient of V and C has only one Eigen value inside V. So, that would imply that C bar also has only one Eigen value has also only only one only one Eigen value. in this V modulo summation Vj. So, what is that namely that should be theta nothing else okay? because this is just induced from C. So, now what we can do you can take this C bar and then restrict it to that V dash. So, it has to map V dash to V dash you can now you can see that if you compute this what will be the action of C, C bar. So, this is going to be some lambda times again uh, identity on V bar V dash because V dash is being irreducible. So, by doing this earlier calculation you can see that on the one hand you get theta on the other hand you get P square by 2 plus P. But since M square by 2 plus M is same as theta and then P square by 2 plus P is also theta that forces P has to be equal to M. Okay. If uh, P equal to M uh, then actually you get H V bar equal to M V bar and X V bar equal to 0. Okay. So, then you can write this V bar into some V plus summation uh, some elements coming from V j. Okay. So, j from 1 to r. So, then you can see that because X is being nilpotent X is nilpotent on capital V itself. So, then there exists some k such that x power k v will be in kernel x okay, because x is nilpotent on capital V. So, that implies this x power k v is actually maximal vector uh, with h eigen value m plus k. So, x into x power k v is 0 and the h eigen value of this x power k v. So, that should be that should be m plus 2 k because this v bar has h eigen value m. So, this v you can choose it to be coming from that m th eigen space. Okay. So, that is why you have this m plus 2 k uh, eigen value, but you already know what are all the 
eigen values of this h na. So, the eigen values of h on this kernel x ok, this h is defines a map from kernel x to kernel x. We already saw that all this v i's that we have chosen to be eigen basis, they all have eigen values exactly m. So, that forces this m plus 2 k must be equal to m ok. So, this is equal to m implies k must be 0. If k is 0, then that means already the vector that you have chosen that is already in the kernel x ok. But that means what? That means v is in summation v j. So, that implies v bar is 0, but by the choice of v bar we cannot have 0. So, that contradict your, your assumption. The assumption is uh, the summation v j is proper inside capital V ok. So, that proves that capital V uh, must be equal to summation v of j, j range from 1 to r. So, now we want to prove that this is also actually direct sum. So, in if not then what will happen? So, there exists some again non-zero vector which will be inside this v of j intersection all this other v of summation v of k, k not equal to j ok. But if you take this v of j intersection summation this v of k, k not equal to j. So, this is actually a sub module inside v j. So, v j being irreducible and because there is a non-zero vector inside this. So, this is being non-zero sub module that forces this v of j intersection this summation v of k, k not equal to j this has to be exactly equal to v j. But v j is what? v j is generated by small v j. So, that forces that this small v j is an element of summation v of k, k not equal to j. But where is v j sits? v j is in the mth eigenspace ok. So, what will be the mth eigenspace of this? mth eigenspace of this will be spanned by this small v k, k not equal to j. So, that will be the mth eigenspace of this summation. summation v k, k not equal to j. So, that forces that this v j is in the span of this v k small v k, k not equal to j ok. But that is a contradiction because by choice v 1, v etcetera, v r they are all actually linearly independent eigen vectors of that uh, kernel x ok. So, that says that the sum that we have is actually direct sum. So, this proves that v must be exactly equal to the direct sum of v j ok. So, it is actually very interesting proof. Uh, this proof actually does not use uh, any other information uh, from any other theory. This is more self contained proof. So, this proof again uses some elementary facts from linear algebra and then uh, proves the complete reducibility of for SL2 ok. So, I would actually kind of recommend you to kind of go through this proof uh, very well because this proof you will not be able to find anywhere else ok. Uh, so, I will actually upload the notes for this proof ok that will help you to actually understand it better, but I recommend you to really go through this once because then only you will understand what happens in the general case ok. I will stop here and uh, we will continue with the structure theory of semi simple algebras in coming classes ok. Thank you.